I, when I introduced the partnership committee, I knew that I would miss people, and I made a, a big whiff, uh, for which I'm apologetic, but I, I do want to acknowledge that uh, Dr. Maria Puhani from the Cleveland Foundation has been a strong member of the committee since its inception, and she's joined here this morning by her sister coming up from Aruba, Inez. Welcome. Welcome to Cleveland. Thank you. So I'm very pleased to have the role of introducing our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Vincent Felitti, who's going to share with us the very important findings from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, the ACE study, which he directed. Uh, Dr. Felitti is a graduate of Dartmouth College as well as the Johns Hopkins Medical School. He's an internist who has been both with Kaiser Permanente in California for many years and is currently a clinical professor of medicine at the University of California. Dr. Felitti founded the Department of Preventative Medicine at Kaiser in 1975 and served as its director until 2001. And it was through the interactions he had with patients there that the idea of the ACE study emerged. And I believe he'll tell us a lot more about that this morning. He has published the results of the ACE study in many journal articles, travels inter internationally to discuss those findings uh, and the profound impact that they have on us all in our communities. Many of you know that over the past decade or so, there's been this incredible burst of research on early brain development. Much has been written by neuroscientists about how the actual wiring of the brain uh, can be affected in positive or negative ways by the child's early experiences. Economists now argue for the importance of supporting young children, citing evidence to show the long-term economic benefits to the individual and the community of early and high quality childhood education and programs. So the adverse childhood experience study shows us the other side of that equation. What happens to children who grow up with significant trauma? It demonstrates the long lasting impact of childhood trauma on people's health and their well-being long beyond childhood into adulthood. The research, I think, provides us with more evidence of how important the work we do is to support children and families and how long-lasting that impact is. We are indeed honored to have Dr. Felitti with us today to tell us more about this research. So please join me in a big welcome for Dr. Vincent Felitti. together, the breadth of community support, I think, is stunning and important because the ACE study, while it has attracted intense intellectual interest, has not yet, in 13 years, engaged any significant clinical involvement. That's been a striking disparity to see. The two pictures up here were both taken in downtown San Diego, this one on the left in the newborn nursery, the one on the right uh, is a large mural covering the wall of a building, the face looking out and overlooking the man who's lying unconscious on the sidewalk. It's an important idea. Why would that person be overlooked? It's, fa it's a fairly routine thing, partly because people don't know what to do, Partly because perhaps people have ghosts awakened in themselves by that view. In any event, if you ask the question, how do we get from here, a newborn with extraordinary potential, to here, the man lying on the sidewalk, that turns out to be a very uncomfortable, but very important question. The ACE study was really an outgrowth of our repeated counterintuitive findings in running a major obesity program where we were using a technique enabling us to reduce a person's weight by about 300 pounds a year, non-surgically, and having people flee their own success. 
As is commonly the case, people fleeing drug programs, alcoholism programs, etc. Why does that happen? The outline of the A study is worth knowing. We decided to ask 26,000 consecutive people coming through for comprehensive medical evaluation in an unusual department at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego, whether they would help us understand more about how events in childhood, specifically 10 categories of events, might affect adult health. 71% agreed, and so we had a population cohort of 17,337 people. We did the study in two waves so that we could make any necessary midpoint adjustment. I should tell you something about the demographics here. The, this was a very middle class population. Um, average age was 57, almost exactly half women, half men. 74% had been to college. 80% white, including Hispanic, 10% black, 10% Asian, basic, basically you and me. Average age, 57. So we're really looking back in time about a half a century to experiences in childhood. That's the retrospective portion of the study. The prospective portion has been going on for the past 16 years. We've been following this group forward to look at pharmacy utilization, ER visits, doctor office visits, hospitalization, and death. So here we're matching what's going on now, roughly 50 and 60 years after the fact. This has been a major undertaking, needless to say. The 10 categories that we studied were selected empirically because of our stumbling into them repeatedly in the obesity program. Three categories of abuse, major emotional abuse, basically recurrent humiliation, major physical abuse, I don't mean spanking, I'm talking serious beating, and the prevalence in this very middle class population of 17 and a half thousand people, 11% for recurrent humiliation, 28% for physical abuse, contact sexual abuse, not somebody flashing a kid, contact sexual abuse, 28% in women, 16% in men, 22% average for the group, major emotional neglect, 15%, major physical neglect, 10%. Growing up in a home where one of the members of that household in your childhood or adolescence was an alcoholic or a drug user, 27%. Losing a biological parent before the age of 18, most destructively by maternal abandonment, least destructively by parental death, because that at least allowed the creation of a protective mythology. My mother would have cared for me if, my father would have protected me if. Most commonly, obviously, by divorce. A totally untouched subject in the literature. Largely, I suspect, because so many of us have been divorced, it's more comfortable not to look at that. Growing up in a home where one of the members of that household was chronically depressed, suicidal, mentally ill, or in the state hospital, 17%. Growing up in a home where mother was treated violently, 13%. Growing up in a home where one of the members of that household was imprisoned during her childhood or adolescence, 5%. That, I mean, this all was very shocking. But whoever would have the basis for knowing because we've all been taught that it would be terribly rude to ask questions like this. But we have done this now with 440,000 middle-class, middle-aged adults over an eight-year period, so it's certainly doable. Some might have lied, but the number of yes answers is overwhelming. And this really struck me, I mean, in prison, 5%, but then I remembered I know two physicians, one a national figure, 
who have sons in the state penitentiary. Now, they don't talk about that, of course, but nevertheless, that's a fact. We were dealing with massive amounts of information, literally several hundred thousand pages of data from these people. I mean, the questionnaires alone were 14 pages per person, and then there's the laboratory slips and x-ray reports and EKGs and everything else. <clears throat> we, we needed to simplify this and so created a so-called ACE score where the number of categories of adverse experience, not incidents or events, but categories, was scored. In other words, if you grew up with two alcoholics in the house, that was simply one point for the category. If you were molested by multiple people multiple times, that was simply one point for the category, etc. It tends to understate the relationship of anything. So we saw that only 33% were exposed to none of the categories and 11% were exposed to five or more of the categories? My God, who would ever know? But <coughs> who would ever have the basis for knowing? What this means from a physician's standpoint is that every doctor in the country is seeing at least two A score five or higher patients every day. I mean, this is one in nine people, 11%. They will be totally unrecognized but they'll be the most difficult and intractable problems of the day. We saw that if any category was present, there was an 87% chance that at least one other category was present, and a 50% chance that at least three other categories would be present, and that women were 50% more likely than men to have an A score of five or higher. This is an interesting man, a very, very bright guy, an amateur psychopharmacologist in many ways. <laughs> e equal, I'm, I'm, I'm serious, he's a very bright and perceptive man, e equally a semi-pro saloon fighter. The backstory is that when he was two, his parents divorced, he never saw his father again. When he was five, <coughs> his mother remarried. When he was eight, and for whatever reason, his stepfather saw fit to beat him pretty much every day. When he was eight, he tells me he remembers he's walking off the porch, going down the stairs to school one morning, and the thought crosses his mind that nobody is ever going to be there for me in my life. When he's 20, he's imprisoned in Rhode Island for attempted murder. Ultimately, he gets out, becomes a pretty good citizen doesn't spend much time at home because his job is on major construction projects. Keeps him away most of the time. Home is not really a safe place for him. But he very responsibly sends his significant paychecks home to his third wife. Listen to what he has to say. He's a very heavy drinker, very heavy smoker, and a heavy drug user. Apropos drugs. Here's an important point to keep in mind because it may be the opening wedge to other insights for you. Everybody is pretty familiar with the demonized crystal meth, you know, methamphetamine. Virtually no one seems to know, to remember, it's an interesting oversight, that the first prescription antidepressant medication introduced for sale in the United States in 1940 by Burroughs Welcome and Company was methamphetamine. Does it mean anything that the most commonly sold street drug is a well-recognized antidepressant? Is that just an irrelevant coincidence? Does that mean anything? If you could... Uh, 20 or 25 years drawing out some uh, poor childhood experiences with drugs, alcohol, cigarettes. Got rid of the drugs, got rid of the alcohol. Next thing I got to get rid of was the cigarettes. And uh, I had no idea that the nicotine played such an important part in keeping that door closed. In keeping the door closed to? The memories that I've blocked out with all these years with the alcohol and the drugs. 
So you see what's happening to you now as related to what happened to you decades ago? Yep. I found a way to block the emotions and the memories. With? Drugs, alcohol, cigarettes. He's talking clearly and perceptively about the functional aspects of smoking, alcoholism, and street drugs. The world's medical literature has extensive array of articles about the psychopharmacologic effects of nicotine. Centuries before, however, American Indians understood the benefits of nicotine. I mean, they weren't burning oak leaves or moss in ceremonial peace pipes. Nicotine has well-recognized potent anti-anxiety activity, antidepressant activity, <coughs> anger suppressant activity, i.e. peace pipe, and appetite suppressant activity. Not only that, that's available in 15 or 20 seconds of inhalation. The risks, which are major, take place 15 or 20 years later. And I think most of us understand that if the screws are on tight enough, we're likely to sell out the future to gain current relief. So this man provides an interesting insight into the utility of many things that we speak of as being dysfunctional, having no idea what the problems are that are being treated with them. Basically, he's speaking about three common addictions. And the conventional view is that addiction, that is to say the unconscious compulsive use of psychoactive materials, <coughs> is due to characteristics that are intrinsic in the molecular structure of that substance. You know, a common example most people believe you take heroin enough times, you're not going to be able to stop. I used to believe that once. What we found was exactly the opposite, that addiction highly correlates with characteristics that are intrinsic to that individual's life experience, particularly during childhood. Let's look at some evidence for that. I don't know what it's like here, but it's very difficult to smoke in San Diego. I mean, you can't even smoke on a public beach or in a county park, et cetera. In spite of the ever-increasing public health pressure against smoking, it's notable that the prevalence of smoking hasn't changed significantly in the past decade or so in the country. Could it be that we're missing the point? Here, when you match ACE score on the horizontal axis with likelihood of smoking in this environment that's notably hostile to it, you see that as the ACE score goes up, the probability of being a later smoker goes up in a stepwise proportionate manner. Every slide I show you will be laid out the same way, by the way. Well, it's kind of interesting. That doesn't fit in with the conventional idea that, you know, People smoke because they pass too many Marlboro billboards on the way to school. <laughs> Here, we look at alcoholism. This is self-acknowledged alcoholism. The question that we used, question 17, was have you ever considered yourself to be an alcoholic? It's probably somewhat understated because not every alcoholic chooses to so acknowledge. But what you see is that as the A score goes up, there's this rather dramatic increase in the likelihood of being a self-acknowledged alcoholic later in life. And here we're looking at injection drug use, a junkie. And what you see is two things. One, the rather dramatic increase as the ACE score goes up, the likelihood of being a self-acknowledged injection drug user goes up rather significantly. And two, it's no longer a straight line progression, but an exponential increase indicating that there is some internally self-worsening process involved here. And if you go to ACE score six, which I don't show because it is so far off the graph, 
at ACE 46, there is a 4,600% increase in the likelihood of being an IV drug user as opposed to ACE 40. Now, the epidemiologists at the CDC tell me that those are numbers, the magnitude of which they're likely to run into once in a career. You know, you think you read in the newspaper the latest cancer scare of the week, you know, 30% increase in prostate cancer or breast cancer, et cetera. Here we're talking hundreds, and in this instance, thousands of percent increases. So if you look at it in a different way, looking at so-called population attributable risk, in other words, looking at the entire population, how much of the, these problems can be attributed to adverse childhood experiences as opposed to perhaps adverse experiences at some later point in life. Alcoholism, about two-thirds, can be attributed to adverse childhood experiences. Drug abuse of all types, about half. Injection drug use, about three-fourths. I almost said injection drug abuse. I've tried to stop using that phrasing because it is really a gross misnomer. This is an interesting woman. She weighs over 400 pounds, as does her sister. It would be the easiest mistake to make to say, well, my God, you have two women in the family over 400 pounds. It must be genetic. It runs in the family. Interestingly, Everyone in that family spoke English. That is to say, English ran in the family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you got the idea. Let us listen to what she has to say. What's the heaviest you've ever been in your life? In excess of 400. So the same as your sister, Patty? Yes. Uh -huh. and, and how and why did you get so fat? Uh, well, I, <laughs> I was abused um, sexually by my uncle, and once again, I used food as a comfort. Um, I didn't have much of a, a childhood because I started working when I was 13. Um, then I got married at 17 to get away. How old were you when your parents got divorced? I recall I was nine. Did you ever see your father again? No. How do you think being abandoned by him affected you in the rest of your life? It affected me a lot, um, especially with the, the growing up years, because like, there was father-daughter dances and dinners, and I'd have to take an uncle, and you know things like this. Everybody else would talk about their fathers, and mine wasn't around. And it was devastating when my mom and dad broke up, I remember very distinctly. A minute or two later, she starts speaking of being chronically depressed. Some people speak of depression as a disease. Some say it's genetic. Some say it's due to neurochemical imbalances, and there's something to be said for each of those. But here's a different thought. What if depression were not a disease? What if depression were a normal response? to abnormal life experiences. And here's the evidence for that. Looking at self-acknowledged chronic depression, what we see is that as the A score goes up, here the example is in women in red, men in yellow, that the prevalence of self-acknowledged chronic depression rises proportionately as the A score increases. At A score of four or more, you are bumping a prevalence of 60%, 6-0% in men, and 35% in women. But you might say, well, I mean, you know, what do patients know about the diagnosis of depression? So we'll look at self-acknowledged suicide attempts. I mean, if there's anything people don't talk about, it's the last time they attempted to kill themselves. And so what you see here, again, we're back in the exponential curves. As the A score goes up, 
the likelihood of attempting suicide at some point later in life goes up rather dramatically. At A score six and more, again, not displayed because it's so far off the scale, at A score six and more, the increase is between 3,100 and 5,000 percent greater than the likelihood at A score zero. In other words, it would appear that depression, suicide attempts have deep roots, quite in contrast to the usual commentary, well, you know, something must have snapped. And here we're looking at the use of prescription antidepressant medication approximately a half century after the fact. And you see, once again, as the ACE4 increases, the likelihood of being on prescription antidepressants roughly a half century later goes up in the same stepwise proportionate manner. Looking at this from the basis of population attributable risk overall, what you see is that for current depression, for chronic depression, for attempting suicide, we're looking more or less in the realm of about half of all of this being attributable to adverse childhood experiences. We looked at biomedical diseases. And this raises the interesting question, well, how do you get from life experience to biomedical disease? Just hold that in abeyance for a moment. And what you see is that as the A score increases, the likelihood of having sexually transmitted diseases at some point later in life goes up rather dramatically. I'm, I'm showing you a very limited sample of what we found. Uh, another slide would show a rather dramatic increase in high-level promiscuity, increasing as the A score increases. High-level promiscuity we used as over 50, five, zero or more lifetime sexual contacts. But then I had some patients explain to me as though I were somewhat slow that I really needed to understand that for some people that would be an ordinary year. And that's true. And the question is why? We looked at the prevalence of liver disease, jaundice. As the A score goes up, the likelihood of being jaundiced at some point later in life increases proportionately. We looked at the relationship to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Again, the same relationship. In short, we saw that with an A score of zero, the majority of adults would have few, if any, risk factors for any of these diseases. I mean, no internist is going to earn a living with this group. With an A score of four or more, the majority of adults either have multiple risk factors for these diseases or the diseases themselves or have died already. Last year, we had an article out in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, I believe it was, to the effect that with an A score of six or more, there was almost a 20-year shortening in life expectancy. So this plays out in all sorts of ways. Not only are lives massively damaged emotionally, socially, but but dramatically shortened. We saw that many chronic diseases in adults are determined decades earlier in childhood, not as once would have been the case. Many of you will remember growing up and seeing other kids crippled with polio and so forth, or you know, rheumatic fever epidemics or scarlet fever epidemics. Those are gone. Now, what is crippling people are life experiences in childhood. And these, the coping devices for these life experiences are often dismissed as self-destructive behavior and that, that phrasing comfortably conceals their functionality. You know, 
Don't smoke, don't you know it's bad for you? Don't use those street drugs, just say no. A memorable quote, reminiscent of Marie Antoinette's observation. The risk factors that underlie so many adult diseases turn out to be helpful short-term coping devices. I never met any patient who smoked to get lung cancer, heart disease, bladder cancer, or emphysema. People smoke because of the short-term benefits of nicotine. So ultimately we saw that adverse childhood experiences are the most basic cause of so-called health risk behaviors or coping devices, of disease, of disability, of death, and of health care costs. I mean, the impact on health care costs, as you'll see in a moment, is huge. And one might ask, well, I mean, why does that happen? You know, that was a long time ago. Get over it. Get a life. Why does this persist? It's an important question. These are, these are two PET scans. A PET scan is a very sophisticated kind of x-ray that depicts biochemical activity superimposed on anatomical structure. And these are PET scans of the, bo of the brains of two three-year-old little boys. Ordinary three-year-old American kid on the right the three-year-old little boy taken from a Romanian orphanage. Many of you may know that Romanian orphanages have been extraordinary in their severe neglect of the inmates. So basically, a three-year-old kid over here who has had no human attention whatsoever, much in the same sort of way that, you know, 10,000 chickens in a chicken coop might be raised. And what you see is large areas of brain that have no color, that is to say, no biochemical activity going on. And at age three, when brain is being formed, I don't think it's any great stretch of anyone's imagination to think maybe this is going to affect the kind of brain that's being formed. And maybe this is why these things are so long lasting. In other words, we're looking at the conversion of life experience into neuroanatomy here. So ultimately, we had to ask ourselves, well, what, what can we do with this today? And what we saw was a great necessity to routinely seek a history of adverse childhood experiences from all patients with whom we were going to be involved with over the long haul. And as some of my colleagues said, but what would I do if I asked and said someone, and someone said yes? The answer to that, we found, was rather straightforward. Tell, tell, tell me how that has affected you later in your life. So I see on the questionnaire that you were the one who discovered your father's body when he hanged himself. Tell me how that has affected you later in your life. It works. It's easy to say. It's short. It doesn't open Pandora's box. The answers typically are a minute, minute and a half long. It's a teaching experience for the person who's being asked. It has major effects beneficially. There are existing systems to help with current problems. They're inadequate in number, but they will always be because the problems are so common, whether they're recognized or not that ultimately one is forced to conclude that if anything meaningful is going to be done on a population basis, it's going to have to be done in terms of primary prevention. Unusual term for some of you, primary prevention. Think back to the polio days and the March of Dimes. Had not some money been put aside for primary prevention, that is to say vaccine research, we'd still be collecting money to build the latest and greatest Sister Kenny Institutes with the most advanced iron lungs in them. 
Now, what primary prevention would look like is another matter. No one really knows from experience at the present time, but it's the right idea, it's the right question to be working on. We integrated into our general medical questionnaire a number of questions related to trauma. Have you ever lived in a war zone? Have you ever been a combat soldier? Who in your family has committed suicide? Very different question from has. Who in your family has been murdered? Who in your family has had a nervous breakdown? If someone tells you that their mother did, that's really a catastrophe then that you're looking at. Were you ever molested as a child, ever held prisoner, ever tortured, ever raped? Anyone dealing with immigrant populations, issues of torture and imprisonment become very common. The impact of this was huge. When we operated the department in our conventional manner, in a biomedical manner, we found that going through the department was associated with an 11% reduction in doctor office visits in the subsequent year. And we were very pleased and thought, well, it goes to show the advantage of more fulsome diagnosis, etc. And that's probably largely true. When we integrated these trauma-oriented questions into our general medical questionnaire in a 125,000 patient sample, there was a 35% reduction in doctor office visits in the subsequent year and an 11% reduction in ER visits. The economic implications of that are staggering. The outpatient budget for Kaiser Permanente in Southern California is $4 billion a year. So if this is replicable, you know, it's hard to just dismiss a 125,000 person sample. The economic implications are huge. Two years later, I should tell you, everything reverted back to prior baseline. Because although the information was in the charts, no one went near that information. The resistance to using it is huge. So what did we finally learn? Well, we learned that adverse childhood experiences are common, but typically unrecognized, that their link to disease and later life expectancy is profound and proportionate that in truth they are the nation's most basic public health problem, that we often mistake intermediary mechanisms for basic cause, such as, well, I'm not depressed. My doctor said I'm taking this Prozac because I have a chemical imbalance in my brain. Well, yes, that's true. But why is that chemical imbalance there? That's not a primary cause. That's an intermediary mechanism after the fact. That what presents as the problem may in fact be somebody's attempted solution. Yeah, crystal meth is a big public health problem. Not to the people using it, though. They're in the unfortunate position of buying the closest thing that helps on the street in unknown dose and an impure form, and hence very dangerous. And the treating the solution may be threatening to people and cause flight from treatment. We saw that in the weight program. Taking people down 300 pounds was terrifying to them. And we had some memorable instances of people becoming intractably suicidal at the lower weights. This woman that you saw, her sister makes the memorable comment when she went from 408 to 132 pounds and became intractably suicidal, being hospitalized five times in one year in a psych hospital, receiving three courses of electroshock to control the depression. The weight was coming off faster than I could handle it. My wall was crumbling. And lastly, we saw that primary prevention is presently the only feasible population approach. Although there's no experience with doing that successfully, it's the right question 
to focus on. I'll stop there. I believe we have a few minutes for questions. And if you want further sources of information, here are some ways of, of getting it. Thank you so much, Dr. Felitti. We do have some time for questions, and I think we have uh, Bob and Marcos with microphones, so if you would just hold up your hand and we'll recognize you, and it's harder for me to see. Go, okay. Uh, thank you for a very compelling talk. Uh, as you were talking, I was really struck actually by something you said right at the beginning about how you feel like this kind of information doesn't have much clinical impact. And uh, I'll just say... Well, well what, what I said was it has enormous clinical impact. It has, exactly, but we're it, not taking it in. Yeah, exactly. So I'll just say, for myself, my area is, is child abuse, and, and generally I find when I tell people that, they say, oh, that's really depressing, and they move on. They might be willing to talk about it in the sense of, other people's children. But when we start suggesting that child abuse is not a problem out there, but is a problem that everybody in this room deals with every day as well, that's really uncomfortable. So I'm just wondering if part of the problem with trying to get people to really absorb this information is we just don't want to go there. We just don't want to acknowledge that all of us, clearly your statistics suggest, many people in this room were abused as children. Of course. But we we, we prefer to understand that problem more as outside these windows. Yes, no, no, no question about that. It, that this is a common problem and that we all need to work together understanding it's a problem for our entire society. Well, w one thought that crosses my mind is rather than attempting to disseminate this usefully in an intellectual manner, because it certainly has attracted a great deal of intellectual interest, would be by trying to get the message across by illustration and storytelling in theater, in particular a form of theater that has enormous audiences and the bill is paid for, that is to say soap operas on television. What if one were to weave into the storyline of a soap opera illustrations of what destructive parenting looks like and how it plays out over time, contrasting that with illustrations of what supportive parenting looks like and how it plays out over time, you'd have enormous audiences and the bill is paid for. <coughs> Some of you may have a link in a university, community college setting where a pilot might be created for such a show. That was probably the benefit of enormously popular shows like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. You know, where lonely kids all over the country for an hour could sit in the company of a grown-up who seemed to be a nice person. Good morning. During your findings, those participants that you found had adverse experiences, did you go back and try to address those experiences, or was it just left with that knowledge that you gained? Well, you, you raise an important point. The answer is no, we, we did not. I mean, many people seeing that 35% reduction in doctor office visits said, well, you, you sent everyone to therapy, right? No, essentially never. What we did, and this was done in the course of listening to somebody's heart and doing a rectal exam and listening to their carotid arteries and a neurologic exam and so forth, what we did was ask via questionnaire, bring this up in the exam room, ask people how these various things have affected them later in life, and in some subtle way or other, made it clear to them that although the story was terrible, they were still acceptable people to us. 
the simplicity of that is misleading in that one could easily dismiss it. I mean, how can you accomplish something so big in so short a period of time? The, the analogy that I ultimately saw was to confession in the Catholic Church, a process that's been present in use for about 1,500 years, minutes, not with any specially trained person, the essence is telling something bad about yourself to a person that you consider to be important, basically being told, well, you're still one of us. That asking and listening and accepting is doing. Believe me, that was not an easy concept for me to, to accept. That asking and listening and accepting is doing. The inhibition is that we've all been taught that nice people don't ask about things like this. And the events, for our comfort, are lost in time, you know, half a century ago, are further protected by shame and by secrecy, and by social taboos against inquiry into certain realms of human experience. questions for you. The first one is, um, what attempts, if any, have been made to incorporate the findings from this study in medical education programs? And in, in, in medical education programs? And the second is, have you had any opportunity to expand the study to look at the impact of, of cultural and societal mores in other areas around the world? Well, <laughs> I'm, I, I speak to the freshman medical students every year about this at the University of California. They, they are deeply interested in it. By the time they complete medical school and are in their internships and residency, a certain case hardening by and large has occurred that they are all locked into the biomedical model. So, so to try to get this integrated in practice has been very, very difficult. I mean, you would think, my God, with the savings of 35% in doctor office visits, this would spread like wildfire through guys of Permanente. Well, it has not. I mean, it hasn't budged out of one department. People are interested, but they insist, well, you, you can't do that. I mean, I can't do that. Um, you know, there's no time. There's no time. Uh, patients would be furious if you were to ask that sort of question. Or out in the community, people might say, well, you know, insurance doesn't cover it. Or, my God, if you ask questions like that, that's opening Pandora's box. I don't have two hours to listen to this. Or, well, if I wanted to be a damn shrink, I'd have been a shrink. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a whatever. <laughs> All of which sounds superficially plausible none of which has any relevance if one really wishes to do this. I mean, getting this information is, is a very important idea that this be obtained by well-devised questionnaire filled out at home, not in somebody's examining room or waiting room, at home. It's a big task to fill it out. We all have inhibitions about sharing private information with other people. Well, I mean, you know, this is an old white guy I'm talking with. I don't know if I feel, you know, comfortable talking with him. This is a woman doctor. And I, you know, I don't know if I want to share this with a woman, etc. This one's Chinese. I don't know if I'm comfortable talking with that, etc. Um, the advantage of a well-devised questionnaire, we found, is that people attribute to it whatever characteristics would be appropriate for them in their idealized interviewer. Once it's out on paper, it's a lot easy for anyone to pick up on it. So I see on the questionnaire that. Can you tell me how that's affected you later in your life? 
that simple process has turned out to be of extraordinary value and comfortable. Now, I don't know if I told you the rest of the story about that 35% drop. Two years later, the whole thing disappeared. They were back to the prior baseline. We use a unified medical record, we look in it, and there are our notes printed literally with laser-like laser, with laser -like clarity, and they might just as well have been printed with invisible ink, because this is not something that people look at. Now, you know, people have said, well, what would happen if, you know, if you were to do this every year? Good question. I don't know. It's a good, it's a good question. The second piece that you asked essentially was, how do different cultures affect this? I, I don't know through per, first-hand experience, but if you want to read about it, uh, a man who formerly was chief physician of the World Health Organization named Einar Helander, H-E-L-A-N-D-E-R, has just written a book called Lost Lives, and it's basically about child abuse around the world. My, my summary of the book might be, if you think things are bad here and now, take a look at what they are in war-torn countries, etc. cetera. Um, they're, they're really horrific. Lost Lives, a book by Einar Helander. Good morning. A lot, a lot of employers are moving toward incentive plans. Um, I'm over here. Yeah. A lot of employers are moving toward incentive plans to encourage their employees to manage their health care outcomes, take more responsibility for managing health care, such as smoking cessation or weight loss. And um, the incentives are usually monetary in some way. And I'm wondering if you have an assessment of those kind of incentive plans. I, I, I have no idea. Um, you know, time, time will tell. I, I wouldn't anticipate them to be highly successful. That's essentially unloading the burden of an unpleasant and difficult problem from oneself onto someone who is less likely to be able to have anything to do with it. Yeah, uh, Mrs. Dorman prompts me to tell you a little story. Today is Thursday. Okay, so uh, on Monday of this week, my 2.30 appointment was a woman I had never met before, 69 years old, 371 pounds, comes in because of problems and concerns about, about her weight, etc. And, and almost at the start, she thanks me for asking. And what she meant by that was in our, the questionnaire that people have to fill out before they enter the weight program, um, we, we have several questions. Uh, one was, what was the most damaging experience that you had in the first 18 years of life. She writes down, being molested. This is what she was talking about, asking, the questionnaire was, was, was asking. Uh, and, and she starts crying in relief that someone finally asked. And then she tells me a bit later that she had once tried to tell her husband when she was 41 years old and slender about having been molested as a kid. And he denied that that happened. I mean, it sounds incredible, but that's what she says. And I've heard this many, many times. You know, your uncle did that? No, don't be ridiculous. You misunderstood. He would never do anything like that. So here's her husband denying the validity of the most important thing that ever happened to her, denying basically her reality. She got divorced not too long after that and promptly gained 150 pounds because she was overwhelmingly threatened by the sexual interest that 
men started taking in her. A simple example of how what is perceived as the problem turns out to be somebody's solution to problems that we know nothing about because we choose to know nothing about them. Maybe our last. Um, I was wondering um, if you think that the study will or could be expanded to include things such as the type of media children are influenced with, um, physiological needs, you know, did you eat a lot when you were a kid, did you have access to food, or things like the kind of parental or caregiver relationships, you know, did mom or dad have a lot of girlfriends? Do you think any of that is relevant to any of this? I, I can't answer you because I don't have any experience with, with looking into that. But at least some of the things that you, that you say strike me as being secondary consequences, not, not primary events. If I understood you, one of the examples you gave was not having a lot of friends. Okay, well, what makes that kind of person? You mentioned about having access to high calorie foods. Well, okay. Um, one goes to McDonald's and looks around. Well, you know, occasionally you see somebody who's really fat inside. Most of them are just sort of ordinary levels of overweight. Some regular sized people. But then the huge number of people who are not in there McDonald's is not a primary cause. McDonald's is simply a mechanism that some people use. It's easy to mistake intermediary mechanisms for primary cause simply because they're easier to deal with. So we wouldn't have this problem if that Dan McDonald's didn't, etc. Think, think about the issue of drug use how comfortable it is, relatively speaking, to say, well, my kid's on that crystal meth because of that damn dealer on the next block. That's what's doing it. As opposed to saying, my kid's buying antidepressants on the street. Thank you again to Dr. Felitti for sharing. I think you'll agree with us. This is really, really important, important information for all of us. And um, I will take a little issue with one thing you said in terms of we don't know exactly what to do. I think we do know uh, how to do primary prevention with the families that we're working with in Cuyahoga County. So I think we are part of the solution here. Uh, to hopefully preventing um, more of those spaces that we saw today. And we want to leave you with children, happy children, because we know this has been a really heavy, heavy uh, talk. Um, before we do that, let me just remind you or tell you that if you would like um, an annual report, you should have probably gotten it electronically, but we do have hard copies. You can pick one up on the way out. It was out a few months ago, but if you'd like to have it, that's great. We hope we'll see you here again next year. And we're going to leave you with the voices of our children. So see you next year.
Ruan B. Summer.